Um, our first speaker I'd like to welcome to the stage, uh, Simon Johnson. Uh, he is a professor at the Sloan School of Management and head of the Global Economics and Management Group. And he's going to speak about generative AI and jobs. Welcome, Simon. Th thank you very much. So I think that uh, most of you have thought about the future of AI in terms of, it, at least partly, its impact on jobs. And I would guess that some of you are in the extreme, uh, what's called techno-optimist camp. This technology is going to be so productive that nobody's going to need to work. And, and the rest of you are in the techno-pessimist camp, which is there will be no jobs for anyone, so we're going to be really struggling. And I want to address what I think is more likely to happen, which is in the middle of that, not quite so optimistic, not fully pessimistic, uh, but there are some big and, and difficult decisions that, that lie ahead of us. This uh, work and what I'm going to speak about is um, based on a book that Dron Asimoglu and I published this year called Power and Progress, Our Thousand Year Struggle Over Technology and Prosperity, and it draws on joint work that we have done and that we do with David Orta in the MIT Department of Economics. Together we co-lead the Shaping the Future of Work initiative. So just to set the stage and, and to tell you and to emphasize how important the stakes are, let's go back uh, 150 years to the Great Exhibition in London in 1851. The British invited everyone from around the world to, to show up and, and demonstrate all the advances they'd made in terms of industry at that point. The Americans came because they were invited, and they brought some animals they had shot and the guns they used to shoot them. That was the, what the Americans had on display in terms of industrial progress. Forty years later, the United States was the greatest industrial power that the world had ever seen. How did that transformation take place? Well, it, in a nutshell, the, 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 the key piece is what historians have called the American system of manufacturing, which involved bringing machines to bear on all kinds of productive problems, but deploying, developing and deploying machines in a way that enabled less educated workers, relatively unskilled immigrants, for example, to become more productive, highly productive, to become the most productive workers in, in the world. And this American manufacturing technology spread quickly uh, around the world and had profound implications, largely positive, and, and certainly in terms of productivity, positive, uh, everywhere it was deployed. So what is AI going to do? And, and, I, and I do think, we think, this is a transformation in technology that's as profound as what we saw in the 19th century. And actually, we know what the two main effects are going to be over the next 10 to 20 years. In part, artificial intelligence will displace labor through automation. That's what automation is. That's how it works. You replace people with machines. But at the same time, and this has been true throughout modern economic history, you also create new tasks, and AI will create new tasks. Now, pre-AI, this is work done by David Orter and his colleagues, we know that the US was generating new tasks at a remarkable rate. So 60% of jobs in this country a couple of years ago didn't exist in 1940. As part of economic growth, you need to gener generate new tasks. AI will continue to generate new tasks, but will it generate enough new tasks requiring expertise? Because you and I get paid for expertise. Is that what we're going to see? Will there be enough new task uh, creation? And who exactly is going to get those tasks? Who becomes productive? Who develops expertise that will be compensated? Now, the good news, well, good news in terms of um, I think addressing some of our really serious problems right now in the US and the world. The good news is that AI has the ability to boost the productivity of people with less skill, people who are, have lower, currently lower paid work. So I don't have time to go through all these papers. There are links in the slides. We'll make the slides available. But the research so far, of course, is preliminary. It's still a, a fast emerging field. The research says it helps you complete writing tasks. It helps improve your grades. It reduces grade inequality. It particularly seems to boost people, for example, in customer service who have less experience. They become better. The people they're helping become more satisfied. And the people providing the customer service have stronger job satisfaction. So there seem like there are some strong wins there for lower skilled people. And there are definitely some big wins available both for workers in terms of higher wages and for firms in terms of higher profits. So part of what we do in our initiative is encouraging firms and people working around firms to think about ways to develop technology that will precisely enable 
improved um, productivity for software engineers, for customer service uh, people, for a, a wide variety of, of particularly white collar workers at, at this point. Th there is an, an active discussion about policy in Washington, D.C., and there will be a discussion on Thursday afternoon at the Sloan School, if you're able to attend that, with some people who are um, involved in drafting and discussing drafts of legislation. I think the good news is th there are several ways in which um, legislation and central government can help move technology in this beneficial direction, including by uh, organizing grand challenges, including by developing appropriate uh, worker rights and protections, including by uh, developing the uh, expertise on AI in the federal government, which is important in, in, in and of itself, so they can understand what's going on, but also help deliver government services. Now, there are obviously some very difficult issues to confront in terms of how companies see workers, in terms of do they focus on workers as, as, as a resource to be augmented, or are they more about cutting costs? That's one very big issue. There's also issues on the worker side. And, and we are absolutely in the business of encouraging workers and worker representatives to think about technology and technology development in a way that they haven't necessarily in the past, because that's the key to whether or not there'll be good jobs for more people in, in various industries. Of course there is a problem, right, which you're all aware of, which is that we've just gone through more than 40 years of digital transformation that's had profound effects, including on productivity in many sectors, but one effect of that transformation has been to increase wage inequality. For example, between, if you look at the top graph, it's for men, the lower graph is for women. Men with a graduate degree, that's the top line. Men who are high school dropouts, that's the bottom line. You can see the way in which their uh, earnings have diverged since 1963. This is also a work by David Otter. Um, and um, there is a real danger that, that I must emphasize that AI, if it's deployed in a way that primarily displaces workers, it will exacerbate this kind of inequality. But it could also go the other way. If we develop technology that makes less skilled, less educated workers more productive, if we build their expertise, and if they're compensated fairly for that expertise, you will close these gaps. And I do believe this can happen in the United States because we're good at solving problems when we understand them clearly, when we're focused on them, and we bring resources of MIT, of people like you, and of people across this society to bear. I am much more worried about the world. I think the innovative capacities that we have, our ability to still run a resilient democracy and, and confront problems and, and, and deliver better outcomes for more people, that is unusual when you look around the world. Many other countries are already struggling and I think will continue to struggle under the pressure of the deployment of AI, particularly to the extent that AI replaces low-skilled, low-income workers in developing countries. Thank you very much.